Sure. Yeah. Hi, it's Steve Hargadon. No, no, I'll go ahead. Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to our our one session today on family sabbaticals. Uh, this was not nearly as popular a topic as gap years or global information literacy, but at least in my own little world, I'm seeing more and more people do this, take this time off. And my wife and I actually did this five years ago. Uh, we had one child left at home and we uh, took a year off and we traveled west. We didn't go to one particular location, but um, it was, it was really a dramatic experience for us and, and one that we're really grateful for. Okay, so Shannon, Harriman, we're going to let you start. Tell us quickly about yourself in this lovely background. Oh, thanks. Um, I'm here at my home in Boulder, Colorado. And, you know, my interest of this I wrote in my little excerpt is both professional and personal. I work for a company called Where There Be Dragons, where we offer programs for predominantly students, but have started a new market for adults and family and custom trips. And so my own personal experience with my family, I have two little ones. We've been able to travel uh, quite a bit and are really committed to getting our kids outside of North America and having experiences, I think, because we're both bought into the work that Dragons has done. My husband and I have worked for the company for about 15 years and we ourselves have had really transformational international experiences. So we've been traveling with our kids and are curious about how to continue to sustain that kind of lifestyle um, personally and professionally, how to attract more and more families to really lean into the risk, I think, of uh, and the excitement of taking larger chunks of time outside of their normal kind of um, pattern in in their world in North America and having deeply transformational cultural experiences. So that's why I'm here. Lovely. Okay, and that raises a couple of questions that let's, let's try and address later, right? So income level and opportunities related to t doing something like this and the variety of ways that someone could do something like this uh, from everything from some kind of a service related thing to even just uh, inexpensively moving somewhere for a period of time, depending on what, what someone does for work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Laura, we're going to let you go next, and we'll let you share your slides. Sure, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Laura Tavares. I'm joining you from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. I'm so excited to be in this group of, you know, kindred spirits and um, people who, who love to travel and see that as an important part of parenting and family life. Um, I'm an educator by profession, I'm a former middle and high school teacher, but for the last uh, 14 years, I've been on the program staff of an education nonprofit called Facing History and Ourselves, and also an instructor um, with Project Zero, which is a really interesting sort of um, progressive education think tank um, based out of the ed school at Harvard. Um, but I'm really here to share something that was coming more from my personal life and a passion for travel and studying abroad, which was part of my experience um, as an exchange student in high school um, in Heidelberg, Germany, studying in Ecuador in college and then spending my entire um, graduate school experience three years in the UK. Um, and, you know, once I sort of settled into my adult life and being a parent, even though our family was lucky to take a lot of, you know, trips and vacations, I was really hungry um, for something more than that. And in particular, really wanting to give um, my daughters who, who love school and who are avid learners, um, who are happy to go to school every day, still an experience um, of learning that was outside the walls of the classroom um, and to help them understand that, you know, school is one thing, but learning is life itself. From me. So I have a few slides to share that just reflect a little bit of our experience. Um, we spent uh, four months, um, at th this time two years ago, um, we were on a four-month family sabbatical that took us through seven countries, um, mostly in Asia, um, China, Japan, China, Nepal, India, Sri Lanka, Australia, and New Zealand. So it was quite an itinerary. We spent about a few weeks in, in each place. And I think the first image that you're gonna see here is that um, my daughters who then were eight and 10 years old at Fushimi and Nari Taisha in Kyoto. Um, and what I wanted to focus on here in this conversation was a little bit of the educational aspect of, of family travel and family sabbaticals. Um, 
as you know, Steve alludes to, the bar is really high. Like we were fortunate to have a lot of resources and jobs that were flexible so that we could take four months off and do this. Um, once that barrier is cleared, I think there is the question of um, if you're traveling during the school year, how to approach um, the education piece and really making the most of traveling um, and really being intentional about learning from that. So I have a few thoughts about that to share and I look forward to talking more. Um, to me, this represents the upside of uh, road schooling, that you can do it in these places that are just incredibly evocative and inspiring. So this is, you know, doing some math on the balcony of a ryokan in um, rural Japan or um, in a yoga shala in Sri Lanka. This was, um, I think they were actually writing poetry that afternoon. Um, Really, this idea of um, learning not just in a different place, but from a different place was really important to me. So before we left, we did try to do a little bit of due diligence about understanding what were the few most like basic things that we had to cover so that when the girls returned to school in January, they would um, not feel like they were struggling and behind. We really wanted to tick those boxes for them. But then beyond that, we opened up a lot of space to be creative um, and to be learning in the moment. Um, this is something that was really important to us, and these are some artifacts from my older daughter who was 10 then, was about um, contracting actually before we left, because you know I think this, the success of our trip, and it was really meaningful and successful, um, started with everything we did before we left, and it continues through everything we've done since. So those of you who have been in the classroom know that contracting and norm setting is a really important part of what classroom teachers do. We found that for us, um, talking about before we left, what are you excited about? What are you wondering or worried about? And then given that, what are things that you need um, from, from uh, the rest of this family to help you? Um, that was really important. And out of every, everyone in our family made a list like this. They were all different. There were some similarities. But out of this, we really were able to articulate um, really intentionally some commitments to each other about um, how do we want to be as family members on this adventure unlike anything that we have ever done before. Um, and then, you know, this idea from John Dewey, which is such an old chestnut, uh, really was my guide in thinking about um, approaching learning from all of the experience on this trip that, you know, just wandering through Durbar Square in Kathmandu or, um, you know, sheep herding on a farm in New Zealand, which was another highlight. Those things are great, but um, in themselves, they don't necessarily provide learning, but reflecting on them is the part that's really important. So we incorporated a lot of um, thinking routines and um, ways to sort of intentionally reflect that were drawn from work that I had done and thinkers I had encountered at Project Zero, including Shari Tishman, whose book Slow Looking is incredibly beautiful and inspiring, um, and Ron Richart, Mark Church, and Karen Morrison's work on making thinking visible. So for people who are coming from an education background, some of these thinking routines might be familiar, some of them might be new. These are all things that you can find online. And the thing that makes them routines and not lessons or something formal is that it becomes sort of an, a lens that you can bring to any experience. What do I see? What do I think about what I see? What do I wonder about? Looking 10 times two is looking at something complex. We did this one day um, actually in Nepal when we were um, visiting a, a temple. And we all wrote down, you know, what are, what are 10 things that we notice? We shared them. And then we looked again, we found 10 more things. And so many questions emerged from that that we were then able to explore. Um, so these have become, you know, because we use them intentionally on our travels, they're ways that we engage with the world now. Um, even, you know, back in our hometown of Newton, Massachusetts, there's still plenty to see, think, wonder about. Um, and then something that I think is different with a family sabbatical than perhaps um, other kinds of, you know, one week or two week vacation or something like that is that you just accumulate so many more experiences and you want to find through lines and make meaning. So towards the end of our trip, we were um, taking time with these prompts about, um, you know, look back over the entirety of our experience. What was something that was hard for you? What was something that made you laugh? Some of the other prompts were um, something that was beautiful something that was kind. Um, and these, I, I, I love um, having this record of what we were thinking then, what we think now when we return to it. And um, this also is the sort of thing that, you know, maybe you would use as dinner table conversation on an ordinary day, in addition to reflecting on more unusual experiences. Um, and then, you know, the, 
thinking about, you know, I, I, I did want them to be writing, reading, sort of, you know, keeping those muscles um, strong as we were traveling. But we tried to do that in the context of authentic work that was really contributing to the family's experience. So the girls wrote for, we had a little blog that they wrote for. Um, we would visit museums and they would sort of use their cameras to select a few items and think about how would you curate your own exhibit based on what you saw here or what you saw in the city today. Um, they were navigators sometimes. Um, they would do research and be tour guides for us. Um, and then we also used a lot of art and, um, you know, art not as sort of a project, um, but art as a way to learn and a way to reflect. Color symbol image is another really beautiful teaching strategy that you can use to reflect on a novel, <laughs> on a moment in history, or on a place. And in this case, this was my, my younger daughter's Jane, color, daughter Jane's color symbol image um, reflecting on her time in Nepal. And they also kept visual journals that you see here. Um, and importantly, these were things that we did together. Um, it wasn't like, you know, Dave and I, my husband and I were reading on our phones or something while the kids were doing this, we would all participate. There was something very democratizing about it. Um, what you see on the left is currently on our um, dining room wall. At the end of the trip, we made it a visual alphabet of the trip where people had nominated, you know, what best represents the letter B, Buddha and bamboo. Um, what represents you, underwear or the lack of clean underwear that we so often <laughs> experienced. Um, and then we all contributed to illustrating it. Um, and those were things that um, are also were part of a reflective practice. Um, and it, it helps this trip stay meaningful and is a sort of touch point for us. Um, and then finally, whoops, slowing down is really important. And that is perhaps the best gift of um, a family sabbatical um, is the chance to step out of your regular life. So um, I hope that many more people will consider doing something like this. Um, this is my contact information and other resources if you want to read about what our approach was. Um, I'm very curious to hear more from the other folks who are participating about what your experiences were um, and also how you help other families through your travel company. So thanks everybody. That's funny. So uh, I noticed on that list, Siri was on the list of things I need. Was that Isn't that funny? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, hey, there were also, you know, the stuff, my stuffed animal. <laughs> there were some very basic things. Very funny. That was great. Are you ready? Yeah, let's see if I can share my screen properly. Okay, I'm hitting, okay. Do you see it? You see it, yep. okay. Um, I wanna say, I would love to go on a family sabbatical with a Project Zero facing history <laughs> uh, professor, instructor, because those are two of my all time favorite educational resources. I draw from them all the time. And I love, uh, I didn't know about all that when I started my family sabbatical. So it's interesting as you two are putting yours, excuse my hoarse voice, um, <coughs> as you're putting yours in context. Sorry, let me. <coughs> okay, we'll try this again. Um, so, I did mine in 2007 at the beginning, January 1st, I think 2007, we took off. And um, this is my very first entry in a blog in 2007. I'd never had a blog. I'd never read a blog. Um, our family sabbatical began. I didn't know there was a thing as family sabbaticals. I feel like the world was very different in uh, 2007 when we left um, and we were gone for a, like three months, um, one term of school. Um, and it really had a big impact on my family. So um, when the possibility of contributing to a family sabbatical conversation or a gap year, which I've also had experience with um, or some of the other ideas in the conference came up, um, I thought this would be a fun thing because I, haven't explicitly talked about this as much, though our family sabbatical really led to a big change in my career. And now I have 12 years of hindsight to share the impact it had on my three children. So 
I'll focus a little more on maybe hindsight. Um, so this is my first blog post, uh, my first entry in, uh, at, it was supposed to be at home in the world, but that was taken on Blogspot. Um, so I, um, we decided to go on this sabbatical um, very spur of the moment. We had family living in the Gambia, West Africa. We were gonna visit them. It was too expensive to take a winter uh, break holiday because of uh, vaccine costs and everything that went into it. And we thought, well, maybe we'll go for a month. And then our family living there said, um, why don't you come for a term of school? And at the time I was not working in education, which I am now, I was working in economic development. And I knew that I had some clients whose work was flexible enough that I could go, but my husband could not. He was able to visit us. So um, made a very spur of the moment decision um, to go and stay with our family in the Gambia, put the kids in school. And at the time my daughters were in sixth grade, eighth grade and um, three going on four in pre-K. The three-year-old is now 16, almost 17. And in 11th grade, the two older daughters are college graduates who are on their own, support themselves. Um, so um, I thought that I would be doing, uh, continuing the consulting work that I had been doing. And um, it changed once I got there because it wasn't as realistic to do that. And I didn't think I'd do a lot of writing, but um, the Philadelphia Inquirer, which at the time was the main, it still is the main paper in Philadelphia. <coughs> Sorry, I sound terrible. Um, so um, the Philadelphia Inquirer, I knew an editor there in, um, and I said, how about I'm gonna do this crazy trip with my kids how about I write an article for the paper about my trip? And the editor at the time said, you know, um, we're gonna embark on this thing called blogs. Um, why don't you write a blog? And I never read a blog. I didn't, I was totally intimidated by a blog. So they set me up with a blog spot. And I started this little uh, adventure of writing a blog. And um, after a, a couple weeks, um, they started posting the blog on the homepage of philly.com, which um, was kind of like this crazy thing that it turned out there was an audience that wanted to know what our little daily adventure was gonna lead to. And um, I have a, I bolded this last paragraph on my first entry. I've been thinking hard about the idea of raising children who feel at home in the world and grow up with a global perspective since I returned from a business trip to China four years ago. This sabbatical, as I call it, because I'd never heard of anybody calling it that, um, to Africa will give us a chance to test some of my ideas on world citizenship. I don't even know if I called it global citizenship at the time and open up the world for us and for anyone who wishes to join us on this adventure by reading along. So I feel like I was very naive um, and uh, we just threw ourselves into this. So I'm gonna just walk through a little bit of, um, this is a picture of, this is my oldest daughter, the second one on the right. Um, she was a very introverted, she still is kind of introverted, introverted, shy eighth grader who I threw her into this school environment. It was an international school, but not kind of a typical uh, international school as we know it. Um, and it was a great experience for her. And I feel like this picture, I share this all the time, my new definition of global citizenship since going to Gambia was be, is be a friend to the whole human race. Cause I saw this play out in my kids. There's a level of novelty um, that they certainly brought to the school, but um, 
it was such a wonderful way for these sort of somewhat awkward middle schoolers, they will admit, um, to just like start fresh. And so that was really exciting for them. Um, they were in a British school system, which was very strange to them, very different. Um, and uh, so academically, I don't know that it was great for them. And I certainly did not do uh, visible thinking routines with them or anything like that. But they, it was, um, I think, uh, personally, it was really positive. And in my case, with the sabbatical, I didn't realize that it would be personally positive at the time because I think there was a lot of difficulty, frustration, um, joy was more the experience of my youngest. So this was her class and she attended a Montessori school um, that did not have electricity, but it was the only Montessori school in the country. And it was a wonderful experience. And she came from a little bit like Newton Mass on the main line in Philadelphia, um, a community where she was usually the uh, brownest or darkest child in her class at her pre-K. And now she's in a completely different environment. And I'd say one impact it had on my youngest, who's this one, um, and I talk about it in Growing Up Global, the book that I ended up writing following um, the trip. I had planned to write Growing Up Global, Raising Children at, to Be at Home in the World prior to going on this trip, but this trip really helped me build an audience. It helped me kind of reflect a little better and sort through ideas. Um, but a, a really interesting long-term impact on this child who had grown up in a pretty homogeneous environment in the suburbs of Philadelphia is that um, she immediately developed a very different sense of beauty, a very different sense of um, like what cultures she would center, what dolls she would choose, what pictures she would gravitate to. And um, I love that effect it had on her. She always chooses the black doll. She always is aware of the racial dynamics from age three and a half. And that had a really interesting impact on her personally. Um, hey, Homa. So, yeah. How many slides do you have? I just have pictures. So I'll just, I can stop. Well, I wanted to just, just give sort of a, a brief intro because I think what you're yeah. saying is fascinating. And I want you to give a whole session on this. This is okay. too good to just limit to the, the few minutes. Well, I wrote a book let's, on it. <laughs> well, of course. Let's, let's pause there, though. Mm -hmm. Because I think, let's see from Laura and Shannon, and, and I've got a couple of ideas of where we might go with this conversation. Because where you started to go there in terms of the impact on your kids is such yeah. a valuable piece, right? So it's something that we think about as parents who are sort of intentionally creating a set of circumstances for our children to grow. There is the financial piece, which Laura, you picked up on. That I, that I think is really interesting, right? But what does somebody say? Well, this looks very privileged to me. You know, how would I create similar circumstances if I don't have the capacity to, to do this? And we, and we might even talk about that, right? Can, could you do a family sabbatical at home? Mm -hmm. right? are, are, there, you know, are there ways that you could take some of these principles and say, hey, you know, we're gonna take X amount of time and we're gonna go to another, the other side of the city and do something. Um, so, Impact on children, financial, oh, yeah, and then what kind of options are there? Like, we don't think of uh, people who work in other countries, expatriates, as being on a family sabbatical, but in a lot of ways, that's where a lot of the content and material comes from, right? So they're living in another culture, they're working there, and they're actually a, a pretty substantial group of people usually in a lot of countries. And so, uh, Laura, what would you like to add? And Shannon, what do you care about? Well, how do we make sure that we, we get enough in this conversation? Well, you know, I, I think um, the question of what is a sabbatical is an interesting one. I mean, it's related to the word Sabbath, a day of rest. And, um, and you know, people celebrate a Sabbath 
in their homes all the time. There, there's a beautiful book by Abram Joshua Heschel about the Sabbath that some people might, if you haven't read it, um, he talks about it as a cathedral in time. Um, I'm not Jewish, but I, I find that a, just a beautiful concept. So, you know, I do think there is, at least for our family, there was a big difference um, in having a trip where we weren't, my husband and I were not trying to work at the same time, because a lot of what made it um, different and allowed us to be so intentional about how we were connecting with people and places and our own children was that we weren't doing this, you know, juggle, which normally characterizes the rest of your life of being on time, making the lunch, doing homework, the, the whole thing. Um, so, you know, I think that was a big ingredient um, as, as much as the fact that we were in these really extraordinary and different places. So that does suggest to me that, um, it is, you know, it is an incredible privilege to be able to stop working for any amount of time and use resources to travel like that. Um, but it does suggest to me that there might be a way to bring some of that mindset either to a shorter trip that isn't that far away, um, or even to how you explore, as you say, um, Steve, a different part of your city that you've never been to. You know, I mean, in some ways, it was much easier for us to imagine going to, um, rural Sri Lanka than it was to imagine going to rural Arkansas, for example. But having now been to rural Arkansas since I got back, there is as much learning there as anywhere. Yeah, I was, I was going to add to that or just um, highlight the piece around pace and intention. And our experiences as a family, you know, we've had really kind of three, the word sabbatical is an interesting one for our situation and that we were both still working. And so we were doing that balancing act. So in addition to like, in our most recent trip, having my children, having started school at that point, I felt similar to what Laura was mentioning in her slides, a little more of a pressure to keep my daughter who was then in the first grade up to a reading and math level so that after five months of stepping away, she could kind of come back and reintegrate. And yet I wanted to keep the focus on the value of the experiential piece. And I was working, so I was trying to homeschool and work. And, uh, you know, I was down to part time, but working from a distance and having to conduct meetings on computer screens. And, and we put our children in a school, in a circus camp for a while, and then we put them in a school so they could have the language integration, um, because that for us was really important, the actual deep engagement culturally. And we knew that if they were always with us in our care, there was a different way in which they were approaching that. So in some ways, and even in Nepal, we put them in a, you know, six hours a day in a school, mostly with Nepali orphans. They were, it was in Nepali medium. They were fully integrated um, in a way that their learning experience, well, it created a really tight bond between them because they became each other's anchors in this experience, but it gave them an opportunity to create their own lens outside of the influence of us as parents. Um, and that has been really important to, for us in our experience is like, how do we as parents create a dynamic in which we also step aside and let our children, we trust our children to navigate these spaces and for themselves lean into edges and really expand their learning zone. Um, because the truth is like, and knowing when it's important to create a comfort zone for them so that they can integrate that learning. So when I think of the intentionality piece, you know, in the work I do with dragons, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with where there be dragons. Um, yeah, great, thanks. Um, but we're very, very intentional about our course progression. And a lot of what Laura was speaking to spoke to what we very intentionally craft at the end of our courses, which is our transfer. So how do we take this experience and kind of land it back in the trajectory of our lives? And especially how do we do that for children? So whether that's through reflection and then having specific projects when you get home where they can draw connections and links to the learning that they've made and the internal growth and that place of reflection. And for our family, because our kids are little, you know, we started when my youngest was almost two and now he's five. Um, we do a lot of storytelling, verbal storytelling at dinner time, where maybe we show a photo and see what memories they can evoke from that. And then we fill it in and we tell the story over dinner. Um, and that's been a really important ritual for us to keep their memories alive, to keep that learning alive, and to find the ways that it stays, you know, integral to the way they're living their lives here. I guess for me, when you say that, Steve, about can we do this in our hometowns? Yes, it's, it, I, I think we can. It's about shifting the lens to see the value of experience, something that's not necessarily being highlighted or 
um, catered to in a more traditional school setting. So I think that lens of looking around and, and being conscious and being conscious observers and engaging with what we have access to in our day-to-day -day life in a different way and continue to tell those stories um, is really important. For me, I'm curious about um, the school pressure that I feel like to drop out of the system here to go on a sabbatical and take our kids away. I feel a lot, I feel like now we're almost like we've like stepped, this sounds extreme, but it feels almost like we're in this prison or something where to get out now, it's like as the kids get older, the get more and more narrow. And I'm like, how do we get out? Like, the requirements from the district and what the proposal we have to put together to get our kids out for five months and the lack of buy-in to the value of the experience we're having from the kind of bigger industrial educational complex is has been really shocking and disappointing uh, to me like we'll lose our seat in our school and you know we um lots of hurdles to jump over and it's actually been discouraging mm -hmm. for me and i'm wondering like how do we continue to step out like and know that we can step back in and be seen and supported and allow the learning we've had to kind of be infused and integrated into my children's classrooms and into their experience in school and how can that inform their classmates or how can that inform conversations so that the learning's not lost like as a member of a community um, I think it's really important for us to feel like our experiences and our voices have a place to land when we return for ourselves and our, our children and how do we create that culture like how do we do that so for me the return but like how do we exit and how do we return like for me when we're actually there the learning is just like vibrant and it's effervescent and it's not hard to engage your kids in that learning zone um, and there are tools you can use and i'm happy to talk about tools but i'm like how do you you know, we can re-enter as a family, but how does our community, how, how do we ask our community to hold that? How do we add to our community? So that's, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to add. I, I have a quote on my wall, and you can tell I love wall quotes, right? It's Lily Tomlin, and she says, the problem with winning the rat race is that you're still a rat. Right, and so there's this, this, there's this dilemma that came up in the gap year sessions. One girl said, I'm afraid that if I go on a gap year, I won't want to go back to school. And we talked about this yesterday, Laura. It's like, okay, what you're saying is you don't actually trust your future self, right? That you would make a decision that's different than the one you make at this moment. And, and there is, Shannon, this really interesting thing. Like we homeschooled our kids in and out, but we didn't call it homeschooling. We called it independent schooling because we felt like as parents, we were the ones who knew what was going to really help our kids. And that wasn't necessarily staying on someone else's track. Now, I had the benefit. Right? My dad was dean of admissions at Stanford, then he was dean of admissions at Princeton. You know, I had the benefit of a family legacy of knowing that doing things differently is often better. But there is this just sense of pressure, you know, what, what happens? And, you know, and, and, and I, you know, sort of learned, <laughs> had a lot of confidence. You know, when, when we would go to my daughter, youngest daughter went to high school and they put her in all these different classes and they told her she was going to be in after our trip. You know, we prepared for her to be in these college bound classes and they put her in all these other classes and they just expected us to go along. I just camped out in the office and said, I'm going to be very polite and nice about this, but no, this is my daughter's education. They didn't know who they were dealing with. That's like, you know, it's like, I'm going to bring you flowers, but I'm here to make the changes. Okay, so let's springboard. Uh, can I from, respond to some of these points? I, I, yeah, I, but let me, really do one quick, let me do one quick segue and let okay. come back. So I want to get to Brady's question because I think there's a, uh, an opportunity here from Brady's question about going from parent to teacher to reframe a little, right? Because, you know, maybe the family sabbatical or family gap year, I think they sort of put an emphasis on some kind of external experiential thing, but maybe there's a thread here of changing your relationship with your children that doesn't depend on travel, right? So it's like, okay, so maybe we can hang on to that a little, this idea that I'm actually gonna partner with my children to help them become adults. And that doesn't require even stopping work or even going away anywhere. Maybe that's the thread I actually care about. Okay, Poma. So I, I ended up 
um, a lot of what I, what I reflected on and talked about in my blog, and then when I came back from our time in the Gambia, related to all my friends and neighbors who were not going to do that trip. They wanted to know how do they do that with their kids. So it was sort of like suggesting bite-sized resources. So like take a weekend. You know, you may not be ready for three months or six months, even local, but take a weekend, dedicate that weekend to um, a culture that you love, that you're fascinated by, anchor it in a concert or an exhibit or friends coming over. So there are so many ways to take shorter amounts of time to I think it's the muscle of learning how to pay attention to who is in your environment, what the resources are. We overlook, you know, like people say, oh, there's no diversity in our community. And it's like, oh, really? I think because diverse people in your community have been sort of invisible. That's what that comment is telling me. So it's a matter of building that skill, that muscle, which is re really about empathy, ultimately. But it's, um, there are so many ways. I don't know, though, that I'd go as far as calling that a sabbatical, like even if it was six months intensive. I do think rethinking where our children go to school and not just picking houses in the suburbs, which are in non-diverse districts, is a worthwhile thing. To, I think there's a whole shift in thinking today around not locating in the in the burbs which lack diversity because we're hurting everybody by doing so that's a whole other issue on the privilege um on the privilege question i think this is definitely a privilege uh issue but i think that with creativity that can be overcome and one of the things that is increasingly possible is like home share, home swap, um, remote work. Um, and so as much as it is wonderful to be immersed in our experience with our kids, I totally agree on this point about trust. My children, especially the older two who are in sixth grade and eighth grade, and they were going to public school and we did work out with their public schools how to transition in and out. That was a really big part of our experience. Um, they did become much more independent than they ever would have been had they um, stayed. And there's a direct link between my middle daughter's um, experience of intense injustice and physical abuse of other children in her class to um, her doing a gap year and her being very clear that she wasn't, it wasn't that she wasn't ready for college. She was very mature, but it was just the most important part of her education to do a gap year. And now I also see she's graduated from college. I see the links and the benefits to that as well. Um, but I think the privilege question can be addressed with creativity, that there are now a lot of different types of resources if someone is passionate about doing it. I think for most people, it's not even in their realm of possibility. So that's kind of our job. How do you move people into seeing this could even be possible for you? This is a brilliant conversation. Okay, so I have a little bit of a conflict because uh, we had a, a two keynotes move and I'm going to need to go get ready another keynote room. Laura, this is your second time here. I'm going to put you in charge. <laughs> so I'm going to make you the host. You go ahead and, and finish out this conversation. I'm going to watch the recording. I'm really interested in seeing what happens. But when you're done, just end the meeting for everybody, and then the recording will process. Thanks, Laura, Homa, Shannon. Keep going. I'm wishing I, I could say that again. I'm going to exit now, too, because I have to leave my home for another meeting. So I was going to have to exit 15 minutes. <laughs> so I'll exit at the same time so I don't disrupt the further conversation. Thank Laura, you. For your 
Laura, and, th thanks, Shannon. Laura and, and Homa, you're going to have a free reign. You make executive Let's decisions. Let's talk about whatever we want to talk yeah, about. <laughs> nice to meet you, Shannon. Nice to meet you, too. I'd love to be involved in whatever moves forward after mm -hmm. this conversation, if more conversations happen. Thanks so That's much. That's great. Thank you. Um, well, I would love to invite um, our other attendees who are here, in addition to Brady, if you have a question or a comment that you would like to pop in the chat, um, it would be nice to be able to, you know, hear what has resonated for you and um, if there's anything else on your minds. So let me just put that ask out there. And then maybe, um, Brady, since you asked that question um, about going from parent to teacher, I'll try to just address that um, first. And, you know, it is like we really did prioritize seeing a lot of places overrooting in one place. And it definitely is a missed opportunity for the kids to not have been able to spend time and, you know, go to school and make relationships in one place. So there's definitely a trade-off on the other hand, you know, they saw more before age 12 than <laughs> almost as, you know, as much as I've seen to, to date in my life. So, yeah. you and know, it's, it's interesting. A, Sorry. I was going to say, it's interesting because we have the opposite, um, issue the country where we were in is like a village mm -hmm. and so the entire time we never left the Gambia we didn't even go to Senegal which is just across the river uh -huh. and so we were immersed in essentially a village for mm -hmm. the entire time mm -hmm. yeah yeah there, so, you know there's so much opportunity I think both yeah. ways yeah. Um, I mean going from being an educator professionally and then being in this sort of you know, teaching isn't the right word, but whatever it was I was doing with my kids was incredibly humbling, first of all, because here I am, someone who goes around talking and teaching other educators about what they should do. And it's like, wow, you can't even do this sometimes with your own children, because Brady is right that um, there were moments when my children were not excited to <laughs> sort of be in that relationship. I mean, I learned a lot about them as learners, which I think has really helped me to be a good partner to them and their actual teachers. Um, understanding, for example, that my younger one really is a very social learner and a lot of her energy around learning comes from not just, you know, working independently and having her own questions, but having a community around that. But I will say the, um, you know, in, in the education world in general, I think educators try to think of themselves sometimes less as the, you know, sage on the stage than the guide on the side. That's the language that gets used. And in this role, you are more the guide on the side. Um, and, you know, often it was so joyful to see my kids through a different light and to have conversations that we might not have had when I was strictly in sort of a mom role. Um, but that contracting and being able to revisit what we said we would be for each other and add to it over time, um, that was really important. I love that contracting. I've also, um, in my uh, travel with my children and in my writing, I do talk about sometimes, um, I find that, you know, people are worried about like traveling with your kids and they're picky eaters and they're, you know, all these like mundane but real challenges. And um, these are things that we talked about in advance even with the youngest. So my two older daughters, we also um, spent some time in Bolivia and Peru when they were only four and six years old. And those were kind of, I had lived in Peru and was doing some work in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. I took the children along my, with my husband. We went together. And um, I basically very simply um, talked to them about how they would react, how it is expected that they behave for, you know, when getting, uh, you know, wild boar or, you know, different things that are mm -hmm. guinea pig, um, how you don't make a face. And we practice that. I'm going to mm -hmm. practice. I'm going to put it in front of you and <laughs> you're going to smile. Yeah. <laughs> and that may seem kind of old fashioned and not, um, you know, sort of, centered in the child as much, but it, it taught them, um, I think, levels of cultural competency, mm -hmm. levels of ability to code switch, yeah. and it has served them very well, but it's these simple, like, we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about, you know, it's kind of metacognition, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to talk about what we're about to experience, we're going to talk about what is expected, 
Mm -hmm. um, that it's not enough to just expect that your kids know how to behave in these environments. Mm -hmm. So even those kind of behavioral cues mm -hmm. um, really help make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, are you, I'm thinking about what, what April shared in the chat here about anxiety around entering and exiting the education mm -hmm. system. And I do think that, you know, the more we're able to, and it's true that in between when you did a sabbatical and when I did it, there were so many more stories and examples out there. You know, I wonder if some of the concern that, that April has and, and Shannon shared too, about um, helping school administrators see the value, like what are the resources that we could recommend? Um, mm. You know, I don't, I don't know of any like studies or anything about the impact of these experiences, but um, I wonder what we could suggest, um, not only for, for April's own thinking, but also, mm -hmm. um, you know, to say, wow, you know, look, school principal, here's mm -hmm. what some other families say about the learning that came out of their experience like this. So, I, um, my kids attended a very strict public school system that prides itself on high test scores. And that is something that so rubs me the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we, what I did to be, to set, I know, I knew that I needed to set up my administration as a partner. I want to be their partner in my child's education. And I think that is a way to help your public school, help mm -hmm. your kids anyway. That's the tuition you pay is your partnership with them yeah. and your respect of their work. So um, we had a meeting um, with each of the teams that taught my sixth grader and my eighth grader. And those are important years, mm -hmm. but I also saw that was our last chance to get away before high school. Mm -hmm. So, um, we talked about what they were going to miss, what was expected of them. Mm -hmm. We got, I did, we did take with us, um, math, uh, mm -hmm. basically the math curriculum. So they wouldn't be behind because they were coming back to school mm -hmm. and what books they were going to be reading. And mm -hmm. so those books ended up, they read those books and, um, they're gonna read books anyways. So they read books that were not on the list, um, that were not on the curriculum, but they did because we knew we were coming back. We weren't gonna homeschool when they were back. We were coming back to the system. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, we followed their, it was just math and reading. Um, we didn't do the social study and the, the teachers and the staff because they understood our goal they loved what we did and can you still see my screen I'm sharing mm -hmm. my screen yeah. this is an example of a really crazy thing that happened um, so this is my daughter Layla who's was in eighth grade at the time um, she, we volunteered at a local school. So this is not the school they attended. Mm -hmm. um, we volunteered at this school. And as you can see, it is crowded. There is no electricity. It's, it's, a, um, it's a difficult, materially difficult environment. The learning environment is very suboptimal. Mm -hmm. The teacher asked her, oh, and she wasn't with me anymore. I was in a different classroom. Her sister was mm -hmm. in a different classroom. Um, so they were on their own. So the teacher, I, I dropped her at the class. Everything seemed fine. The teacher asks her, do you know how to add fractions? And she says, yeah, I can add fractions. And so she said, good. So she gave her a stub of the chalk and she said, I got to go. You teach this class. Oh, wow. So she left her alone with these like 30 some kids and to teach them how to add fractions. Now, I'm not advocating that a total novice go in and teach anybody anything, but it, um, it was amazing. Um, there wasn't time to feel inadequate. There wasn't mm -hmm. time to question mm -hmm. your ability. And this, this, I think, became a really almost foundational experience for her. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. She taught them. She shared how she learned it. 
and it was incredible. Mm -hmm. But this was the moment before the teacher left, me dropping her off, thinking, oh, she's just going to sit there and observe, and then ended up, she had to teach the class. So, yeah. you know, of course, we can make the case that they're going to have a much more powerful education. You know, it's that whole mm -hmm. thing of not letting your school get in the yeah. way of your education. Yeah. Um, she had a much more powerful education. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. And um, the results are not a straight line. What they mm -hmm. took from it was not what I expected for mm -hmm. either one. Um, so that was interesting. This was my middle child. And this was the day, one day that she was in class and the teacher had her um, basically uh, grading the papers of the kids that came in. And, um, you know, in her little sixth grade way, it was like playing school initially. Yeah. Uh -huh. But something happened in that class that made her very upset. And I didn't know about it until later. Mm -hmm. um, children were the physical punishment mm -hmm. is still practiced in the in these kinds of school where the privilege level is extremely low. These are the subsist subsistence families living on $2 a day. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so like that boy's shirt, he does not have buttons anymore on his shirt. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why it's open, you know, that, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and so children were hit and they were, it was extremely upsetting. It was kind of, you know, traumatizing to mm -hmm. an 11 year old Mm -hmm. um, to watch this and to be, you know, the teacher to like ask her, like, did they bring in their work? And if she said no, that child is going to get hit. Mm -hmm. And so this child who's now 24, um, she has a very deep sense of social justice. Mm -hmm. Her work, she majored in Africana studies and art history in college. She's mm -hmm. an artist and very creative and um yeah i think i'm gonna start crying <laughs> yeah, it sounds so powerful and you, you know, know. And for me it raises a question too that you know comes i think up in this in this story and in, in many other kinds of travel experiences about you know these encounters with difference and the way that they um you know, we want our kids to see what we have in common with everyone. We also want them, I want them to recognize what is difference. In fact, we are not all the same. Um, I don't want my kids to feel like, oh, I'm so lucky and poor everybody else, right? Yes. I want them to yes. see the assets um, yes. in the places that they are visiting. Um, yes. And I don't want the, um, I, I hope those experiences don't actually sort of reify a we and they feeling or a power dynamic about the world. So you know, when my kids get to share something, but also receive hospitality or be cared for. But I think it's really, um, and I'm sure, you know, this was part of your experience too in Africa, navigating that is, um, it, and, and figuring out what are they learning that I may be not intending for them to learn um, is, is a tricky um, feature of, of this kind of thing. I think it, it and that's so important on a fan, when you do, um, whether it's a sabbatical or a vacation, yeah. also vacation. Mm -hmm. um, where are you staying? Where yeah. are you? What are your experiences? Are you seeing it behind a wall or are mm -hmm. you um, developing relationships? Mm -hmm. So for us, it was all about relationships. We lived in the same neighborhood as that school. Mm -hmm. But there was so much integration. We lived in privilege. I'm not going to say we didn't. My mm -hmm. brother-in-law and sister-in-law, uh, they've lived, they lived there for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, they did have built up privilege, but it was so interesting because it was still part of that same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we interacted with those children. We knew them. We had relationships. Um, so I think there is a realistic to mm -hmm. recognize that I am privileged. Mm -hmm. I am extremely privileged to do this. And with that, there's responsibility. So mm -hmm. not pretend like it's not there yeah. because it is. Yeah. If you have a choice to do this, even if you're not considered wealthy here, mm -hmm. you are privileged. 
um, you are privileged to even consider this. So we talk about that. We mm -hmm. always talk about that. And um, that is part of our experience. We, yeah. you know, so seeing this darkly mm -hmm. uh, sort of create and, and how we teach, you know, sort of what our orientation of service, mm -hmm. uh, our oneness with mm -hmm. them, we, we were, you know, my family were immigrants who have their immigrant story and there are certain environments where we are not the privileged and in the majority. And yet there are certain environments where we are the most privileged. Mm -hmm. And so we don't take that for granted. But yeah. I think that's part of articulating, like I love the way you articulated your hopes and goals and wonder, mm -hmm. see, think, wonder, like I love that. Mm -hmm. I think articulating what your family values are yeah. is really important. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's and really, I think sharing and exploring together in the midst yeah. of and after the experiences, you know, how do these experiences shape what I think is important? Yes. Um, how do they shape my sense of responsibility? I just want to point out for people who might not be looking at the chat, Brady shared an interesting link, um, workaway.info, about um, places to work, um, nonprofits and startups um, in other countries. And that sounds like a really interesting resource, too. Um, I know we're almost at the end here. So since I have been thrust into the role of <laughs> webinar host, <laughs> um, I want to make sure that we that we wrap up on time. It's been so wonderful to talk with you, Homa, and to see your beautiful pictures. I'm really um, inspired. And I just wish the best to all of you who are listening, who are um, embarking on planning or contemplating an experience um, like the ones that we have been sharing. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat since my, I don't have my um, slides up, and I would just be happy to be in um, further conversation with anybody um, about anything that we discussed today. So thanks, Likewise. everybody. Likewise. Thank you. So nice to chat with you as yeah. well. Yeah, nice to and meet you. And our almost similar last names, which is That's very right. unusual. <laughs> <laughs> That's a rare thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Thank thanks, you. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.